I'm Jonathan. This is Robert. Shabbat Shalom. So today is Jewish Sabbath. We're here in Galicia Jewish Museum in Kazimierz, the Jewish Quarter. So I thought we should start with Shabbat Shalom. So right back at you. Tonight is a Jewish holiday, as it were, Shavuot. Tonight, the holiday of Shavuot, we celebrate when the Ten Commandments were given to the children of Israel. Uh, and the way that we celebrate it, a lot of praying and praying and praying, that's usual. But what, the interesting way that we celebrate it is by studying all night. We stay up all night and study all different texts and pretty much anything that's interesting. Uh, so I think it's very appropriate that we're here in the Jewish Quarter, in Kashmir, the Jewish Museum, and learning and being inspired today. So good for us. Uh, Kashmir is a place of transformation. It's a place that's been transformed, that's being transformed, and a place that transforms others. In our work at the Jewish Community Center, we're focused on rebuilding Jewish life in a place that Jewish life was almost completely extinguished. So Krakow was one quarter Jewish before the war, 65,000 Jews, over 90% killed by the Nazis, and then Jewish life was forced underground during communism. Uh, and now it's thriving, it's coming back, people are finding out about their Jewish roots, we're, welcome, we're welcoming them back into, crack, into, uh, into the Jewish world, and this is really how it's being transformed. And the way that it's transforming others is the people who come through and people who see this. Poland and certainly Krakow, we're down the road from Auschwitz, about an hour away, um, an hour's drive, a little longer if you cycle, um, is seen as a place of loss, is defined as a place of tragedy in the Jewish world. And people come through and they connect to our community, they come in our Jewish community center, and they see a place of life, a place of color, a place of optimism, a place of hope, and in a, in a Europe that's in many ways a darkening place for Jews, Poland is a light unto the nations, and it's really the one place today in Europe where it's easier, safer, and better to be Jewish. And this is a remarkable, remarkable transformation that's going on, focused right here, or headquartered right here in Kazimierz. I'm not from here, although I've been living here for a while. I moved here 14 years ago when I met a Polish woman, decided to move to Poland, and I did what normal people do, which is get on a plane and fly over. Robert here had a different idea about how to get here. Yeah, I think it was the idea of taking one of those budget flights from London to Krakow that really put me off, you know, being cramped up, very frustrating, very boring. So actually, I decided to cycle. And like Jonathan, I also met a beautiful Polish woman. Uh, unfortunately, it's a bit pixelated out, out there, but she is in the front row if you want to take a closer look. Um, <laughs> Because of Basha, I wanted to come over to Poland. And as we discussed the idea of me cycling from London to Poland, uh, we thought there should be sort of a deeper meaning to the trip. And the idea of cycling from London to Auschwitz came about. It would be a meaningful destination. It would be a challenging distance, but it could be a commemorative ride for those who'd lost their lives during World War II. Now, I'd actually visited Auschwitz with my father three years prior to that and I felt incredibly moved, like many people are, by the content. And there were so many questions that came out of the whole experience, questions that I didn't even know existed. Despite having a good education growing up and a Jewish identity, it wasn't until I was actually standing in the actual spot where this genocide happened not so long ago that I began to appreciate the value of history. And like with everything, you can do more if you want to. So I was determined to do this bike ride from London to Auschwitz. I wanted to dedicate more time to try and answer some of those questions that I had formed. I no doubt would have asked or, or would form more questions as I went across this journey. I also wanted to educate my friends and those who hadn't had the opportunity to come and visit or those who just didn't know as much. Now, the idea of a slow cycle alone across Europe sounds quite depressing, especially in the context of history of World War II. So I wanted to make sure there was a positive spin on the whole trip. Therefore, I devised a liberation path, Trace, which would follow those soldiers who would be delivering freedom across Europe as they liberated the whole of Europe from Nazi hold. So I visited a lot of significant sites. I started at Westminster, 
And this is where the decisions would have been made by the Allies, by the British and the Americans, to come over and start those attacks on D-Day. Immediately, the question of why did they not attack earlier, even just a few months, would have saved hundreds of thousands of lives. They surely knew enough information, but why didn't they attack earlier? Now, this, this question is extremely difficult, especially difficult to answer if you're by yourself on a bike going across Europe. These questions happened 20, 70 years ago, rather. So I wanted to bring it back to today. What does it mean today? We're all very aware of crimes against humanity that go on in the world. And now, with more resources than ever, what are we meant to do? What, what's the right thing for us to do within these situations? From London, I cycled down to the south coast and I crossed the channel by ferry to the Normandy beaches. I tried to contemplate the huge operation that was D-Day, and I tried to imagine these soldiers on the front line risking their lives stepping onto en enemy territory for the first time. I continued on to Paris but via the Palace of Versailles, and in this room, the Hall of Mirrors, this is where the treaties after World War I were signed. Many commentators suggested that it was this treaty that put so many harsh reparations on Germany. It was this treaty that led to pave the way for World War II, that led to Hitler's rise. I stopped in Paris for a little rest and recuperation to try and come back to reality. But it wasn't long before I continued on towards Verdun, the forest of Verdun, where a lot of the World War I fighting took place. There were many cemeteries that went with it, and stuff that I didn't know before I actually visited. I saw the World War II trial rooms in Nuremberg. This is where the Nazi war criminals were tried after World War II. And this asked, made me ask the question of what was the correct justice? Was it just this trial system? And then also relating it back today, what are we meant to do when we now find Nazi war criminals? What's the right thing to do? What's the correct punishment. And similarly, outside of Nazi history, if there are other crimes against humanity, what are we meant to do with them today? What's the correct thing to do? I continued across Germany onto Flossenburg camp, which was the first Nazi concentration camp of my journey. I didn't know much about the Flossenburg camp, and it was extremely difficult as I had to tour the whole camp alone. There were many hundreds of thousands who would have passed through here, many of whom would have died but I didn't know about this camp before I embarked on this trip. A real milestone was this demarcation line. This is where the American army and the Russian army met, trying to imagine what it would be like to be closing in that gap across Europe as those who were fighting your enemy were coming from the other side. I stopped in Prague, and my mom actually came out to visit, but she took a plane like a normal person. Um, and we visited Terezin, which was a transit camp, not, not just outside of Prague. This is a place where many hundreds of thousands of people would have, been, would have gone through on their way to one of the six Nazi death camps set up. I got a little bit homesick between there and Auschwitz, but I finally completed the ride after 25 days of cycling solo. I had mixed emotions. I had deep sadness at trying to comprehend the history. But strangely, I was also having happy emotions for knowing that I was going to finish this bike ride and I didn't have to get back on the bike, and I could get off of that saddle and have a little rest. It's kind of weird arriving at Auschwitz with some happy emotions. Now, once I arrived in Poland, my girlfriend Basha and I, we were um, luckily invited to the JCC for a Friday night Shabbat dinner. And it was here where we got to meet some of the surviving generation, these people who have stayed in Poland despite the history, these inspirational people are still exercising a Jewish life. They're still keeping up traditions that were thought to be destroyed, especially in this part of the world. These people are the ones who are rewriting the history books. They're turning the full stop that comes after Auschwitz and turning that into a comma and continuing the sentence. During my bike ride, I asked many questions about history. I tried to understand the situation of the incomprehensible death and suffering. But at this JCC, I saw life. I saw people learning new languages, making new friends, creating new memories. It was here that I realized my bike ride shouldn't end at Auschwitz, a place of sadness and death, but it should end at a place of life and happiness at the JCC. 
the question came about of what can we do today to make our future better? And the answer is, we must live. We've got to go on crazy bike rides that go across Europe. Um, we've got to meet new people. We've got to experience life, because if for nothing else, life is made up of experiences. And if you haven't experienced anything, then you just haven't lived. There's no shortage of people who want to memorialize the past. And definitely, that's incredibly important. But just as important, if not more so, is what we do today and to prepare for now and the future. These people here, who were very lucky to have escaped the horrors of the past, their family and their descendants were sitting next to me in classes at the JCC, continuing life. This is the most powerful message to me. This is the strongest response we can have against the Nazis, that we can have against Hitler, to live our life today. So after this contemplative ride, it was time to come back to reality and work out what I should do today. So I decided to set up Ride for the Living. The idea, the emphasis being on for the living. Along with Jonathan, we created a shorter bike ride that a group of us could do together, which would go from the gates of Auschwitz, a place of death and place of sadness, to the gates of the JCC, a place of life and a place of happiness. To me, it's the perfect answer to the question of what should we do now. I never thought much would come from my bike ride across Europe. But now, it's turned into something deeply meaningful for many people. Last year, we had 15 people from the UK, from America, from Israel, and from Poland complete the ride. The journey added positive action to the necessary and important memorial. The money raised from this sponsored bike ride went towards supporting the Holocaust survivors at the JCC. It went towards a trip for all of them to enjoy across Israel. And just a few months ago, Jonathan made a lot of dreams come true as he led the group of 30 Holocaust survivors from Poland across Israel. Thank you. It's not easy bringing a group of 30 Holocaust survivors anywhere. And as you'd imagine, bringing them to Israel is, uh, was a complicated, complicated event. Here we are, the airport. That was uh, the easiest part. Um, a lot of them had never been to Israel before. Some hadn't been on planes before. And one of the older women had never been on an escalator. So as you can imagine, we, it was, a, it was a, definitely a bit complicated logistically. But it was important for them. Many of them had family there uh, that, they, that they'd never met, that they'd never seen. So it was important for us to bring them to Israel. Uh, we went around. They met with family. We did touristy stuff. We here were in the Dead Sea. I, some of the photos uh, of us in the Dead Sea I thought I shouldn't show you. Uh, those are available privately. Um, we went to the wall. It was really a very, very meaning trip, meaningful trip. And if not the first time for all of them, then almost, prob almost definitely the last time. One of the things that was the most interesting was our visit to Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem is the Holocaust Museum in Israel. Originally, I'd left it out of the itinerary for the trip. I thought, you have a bunch of Polish Holocaust survivors. I would think the last thing that they want to do is to go to Yad Vashem. But as they do very often in the JCC, they corrected me, some of them in quite a loud way, and said, are you crazy? What? Well, of course we want to go to Yad Vashem. And why did they want to go primarily? Most of them were ch children during the Holocaust. They're child survivors of the Holocaust. And they were saved by non-Jewish Poles by righteous among the nations. And it was very, very important to them that they would go to Yad Vashem, where there's a wall uh, with all the names of the, of the non-Jews who saved Jews during the war. And uh, the largest number of them are Poles. And to be able to pay tribute to the people who made their lives possible. And for this, and I think for all of us, that was really the most meaningful part of the trip. So. As it was a complete success last year, we never thought um, it would be so fantastic. We have to repeat it again this year. And this year, we're hoping to have nearly 100 people in just a couple of weeks completing the ride together, coming from all countries over the world. And when we started talking about this trip, this ride for the living, we thought it would be a fantastic thing for the younger generation to do a bike ride for the surviving generation. We never thought we would actually have a survivor on the trip. But this year, amazingly, a man named Marcel Zielinski, an 80-year-old man who's living in Canada now. Um, he's going to be joining us on the ride. Marcel was actually liberated from Auschwitz himself when he was just 10 years old. 
After the Soviets cleared the camp, he was freed from the fences, and he decided that he should head back towards Krakow, where he was from, where his family was from. And with no means to get there, he ended up walking the full 95 kilometers to Krakow. All he had was the prisoner uniform from when he was inside Auschwitz. Eventually, he made it there. He was taken in by an orphanage, and just a few months later, he managed to um, reconnect to the remaining small parts of his family. And since he's moved to Canada, but he's an extremely keen cyclist, and he's going to be actually joining us for the full 95-kilometer bike ride in just a few weeks, which um, his, his son's going to come with, and his granddaughters too, and I'm very much looking forward to standing outside Auschwitz with all of them as free people to complete this ride. So the money raised from sponsorship this year will again go towards the Holocaust generation, the survivors who are still at the JCC. It's important that we do this because the unfortunate fact of life is the surviving generation won't be with us for very much longer. So it's important that we do this for them. The Ride for the Living event as a whole is set up not just as a memorial ride, but it also focuses on education whilst also celebrating life. We're also bringing sponsorship together to help support the growing community. This, for me, is what I think is the best answer to what can I do today. So why does all this matter? Why is all this important? One, if we all follow Robert's lead and stop using planes and ride our bicycles everywhere across the world, we can do a lot to end global climate change, which is our responsibility to do. So we have to all get in shape. Two, if a Jewish community can thrive in the place where it was almost extinguished, an hour's drive from Auschwitz, the epicenter of the Holocaust. If a community can thrive here, then no community is ever beyond hope. There's always, there's always hope for no matter what any community or anyone has gone through. And I think it really speaks the, the, mir the miracle of the Jewish revival today in Poland, especially in Krakow, I think speaks is beyond the Jewish question and speaks to the resilience of the human spirit. And the last region, you know, we all very hear the quote, or we all know the quote of Santayana. Those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it, uh, which I would condemn to repeat it, doomed to repeat it, which I would agree with, but I would add a caveat to that. I would say that those who study history and focus too much on history, and sometimes that happens with Polish, with Poland, is, there's almost too much of a focus on the negative aspects of the past. I think that there has to be, are, are not allowing themselves, focus too much on history, you're not allowing yourself to prepare and to build for a future. And we see by balancing both while commemorating the past, while looking to the future, we see that there is an incredible result, which is revival of Jewish life in the place that nobody ever thought it was possible. Four, three, two, thank you. <laughs>